We now join together in the reading of the psalm of the day, which comes from Psalm chapter 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with cla clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 3. You can follow along in the Pew Bible on page 968 or in the bulletin. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. A man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful so that he could beg from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, Look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up and started to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. So as we continue going through the book of Acts, the goal is to recognize that Jesus, as he is risen from the dead, is still alive. He is still at work in the world and in our lives. And how do we carry that good news, that power of Jesus, with us everywhere we go in our daily lives? 
So how many of you have heard this story before? That you're familiar with it. It's one of the most famous, like, hey, one of the first miracles of the church, and wow, isn't that great. How many of you have ever prayed for a miracle? Okay. So most of us have. And some of us probably have seen those miracles happen. I'm going to tell you about the first miracle I ever prayed for. And if our confirmands already know this story because we talked about prayer several weeks ago. So the first miracle I ever prayed for, I was in elementary school or early middle school. And been going to church and Sunday school and you read all these wonderful stories, right? Look at, look at what Jesus did. Look what the Holy Spirit did. Look at these miracles that happened. And how many of you were told growing up, well, God can do anything. Anybody been told that, right? And it's true. The Bible teaches that. The Bible shows that. This is what we believe. He could do anything, even raise Jesus from the dead. So I went home and I was like, well, if we are supposed to pray to God, right? Anybody been told you're supposed to pray, right? Jesus says, ask for anything and then expect a miracle. So in my fifth grade mind, I went home and I started praying for two things, two miracles. I kind of want them at the same time, though. So it was kind of one miracle, two in one kind of deal I was asking God for. One was a brand new bike. Eventually, I got it several years later with my own money, which so didn't happen. But I prayed for a brand new bike. I was like, I, and not just, you know, hey, maybe for a Christmas present kind of miracle. It was, no, I want to wake up the next morning, and there's the bike. And then right next to the bike will be the second miracle I prayed for. Because in my fifth grade mind, I thought this was all the money in the world. I prayed for a pallet. I don't know why I thought of a million dollars stacked on top of it. So my prayer that I was asking God for was, I'm going to wake up to a bike next to a pallet of a million dollars. Now eventually God gave me the bike. Still, still praying for the pallet of money that we really need, right? Now here's the deal. Didn't wake up to either one. And I was disappointed. And I was sad. Now it's also a little bit of a ridiculous prayer, right? But sometimes we do struggle with that of, I'm praying for a miracle. God, I'm, I'm praying, God, for you to do something. Like, I, I know you're the only one that can, that can heal this thing. I know you're the only one that can fix it. I know you're the only one that can restore the relationship. I know, I know God, you're the only one that can do this. And you pray that prayer. You pour your heart out. You ever woke it up disappointed? Oh, man, it didn't happen. Right? So maybe you're not praying for a bike and a million dollars. But I bet we've all been there where we are praying for miracles and then we wake up the next morning and we're a bit disappointed because it, it didn't just happen. And I think that's the trouble with stories like this. I love this story. This is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. But sometimes what we do is we read it and we go, wow, what a great story. What a great thing God did way back then. And if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times we think, and we even believe in our hearts, too bad he doesn't do it anymore. Now, you might not want to admit that out loud, but I'll admit that out loud, that sometimes I struggle with that. Boy, it'd be great if he still did that. See, this is the whole point of the book of Acts. This is the whole point of Easter, is that, that our God is alive that he is still at work, and that he works through regular people. And so today, as we look at this story, what I, I want to do for you is to show you three ways that God is still at work in your life and in our world in the same way that he was at work in the lives of Peter and John. All right, so we see here Peter and John in verse 4. We're going up to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And a man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple called Beautiful so that he could beg from those entering the temple. So the first thing that I want you to see in this story and see about who our God is and how he works is that our God works the extraordinary in the ordinary. Peter and John went to that temple every day multiple times a day. If you read the previous chapters of Acts and, and you continue reading the story of Acts, you'll see that, that this was ordinary work 
for Peter and John. They went to the temple every day, most of the time, multiple times a day. One of the things that we forget about our God is that he, he works in our everyday lives. That the, that the miracle he is working in your life sometimes just happens on a Tuesday afternoon when you're staring at your emails. Now you're thinking to me, <laughs> it never felt like a miracle looking at my email inbox, right? But we, we forget that this is how God works, that he works in the ordinary. This man is waiting for a miracle. Yes, he, he begs for alms. He begs for people to provide for him. But how often do you think he ever prayed to God, could you please just heal me? Given his age, he was probably alive while Jesus was doing his ministry in Jerusalem. And how many times did Jesus heal people? And do you think he heard about it and thought, why can't that be me? So for Peter and John, the miracle that God does through them happens in their everyday, ordinary lives. They are just going to work. They're just going to school. They're just living their ordinary routines, and then God works through them to change somebody's life. For this man, the text even says, no, he went there, or was carried there, every single day. Right? I bet some of you have prayers you've been praying for years, waiting for them to finally be answered, right? And this man probably hears about all the things that Jesus is doing, all the people that are being healed, and he's going there every single day. Yes, he's asking for help, but he's also probably praying for a miracle. Why can't that be me? And the miracle that God works in this story happens in their everyday lives. And the reason that's so important is because a lot of times we think God can only work the extraordinary if I go on a trip. Anybody ever been on a mission trip? They're wonderful. They're beautiful. God does change you and change the people you serve. Anybody ever been to like, like a camp retreat kind of thing? And then you get that, we always call it the mountaintop high, right? Like as if it was a good retreat. <laughs> and then you come back, you're like, oh, it's all, I just wish I could recapture and just hold on. Like anybody, ever, you're just like, I wish I could just bottle up that experience, those emotions, right? Because what do we think? Got to go back to work. Got to go back to the same ordinary routines and, and things. And, and, you know, God works over there. And we forget that, that God works right here and now. In your ordinary routines of changing diapers or raising kids, your ordinary routines of going to school and going to work and, yeah, putting up with your boss or putting up with your employees or putting up with your pastor. Okay, like, it's just like God is working in all of our ordinary, regular rhythms. We, we forget that because we see the miracle. We're like, wow, I'm not Peter and I'm not John. Well, Peter and John were just going to the temple like they did every day. This man was going to the temple and praying for a miracle like he did every single day. This is the beauty of our God being alive is that he works the extraordinary in the ordinary. Uh, call day was this uh, past week for the seminaries. I don't know if anybody paid attention. I pay attention because 10 years ago was our call day, and now I feel old, okay? <laughs> and uh, don't come up to me after service and be like, Pastor, you're still young, because I don't believe you, okay? So <laughs> it's doing a lot to me, existential crisis this week of like, oh, wow. All right, so during our first call, we went out to Maryland in the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, became friends with a, a man in our congregation named Mike, and Mike worked for the government because in D.C. everybody works for the government. And one of the rules when you're working for the government is you, you can't talk about Jesus. Like you can't send an email and be like, just to let everybody know on this email chain, Jesus loves you. We'll see you at the meeting in 10 minutes. Okay, like you can't do that or you will lose your job. Okay, now you can talk about it on your own, like, hey, someone brings it up to you. And so Mike was coming to me, and we were reading the Bible together. We were meeting weekly, and he was wanting to know, like, well, how, how does God work? Like, how is God going to use me? We talked about it, and we prayed about it. And I told him, Mike, Mike, how many days a week do you eat lunch? He's like, five days a week. 
during my lunch and everything. I was like, cool. Who do you eat with? And I thought, oh, nobody. I just eat by myself, right? Which is very American. I just could eat by myself in my car or in my cubicle and move on. And I was like, okay. So, like, just invite somebody that you work with to eat with you. And now you have five opportunities to love them and get to know them and eventually share the good news of Jesus with them. And he didn't believe me. He was like, ah, oh, okay, well, it's just eating lunch. And I was like, yeah, it's just eating lunch. Mike does this, and eventually a young man who was in his 20s at the time that worked with him, who did not believe in God, and absolutely, actually, once we got to know, hated the church and basically like all the stuff that we teach about moral living. Okay? And one day, he finally, after having a few lunches with Mike, asked him, he goes, hey, Mike, you're a Christian, aren't you? which sent him into a sheer panic. Mike was like, oh, no, what do I do now? <laughs> okay. He was like, yeah. Okay. Well, can you tell me more about Jesus? Now, here's the thing about Mike. Mike grew up um, with the mentality that talking about Jesus, reading your Bible, only happened here in, the, in, the, in this sanctuary. No, that's... You, you go to talk about Jesus and read your Bible with the pastor at church. God only works over there in the special place at the temple. We forget that he works in the ordinary. So what I did was I messed with Mike because that's what you're supposed to do as a pastor. I've learned that over 10 years. You just mess with people. All right? I was like, Mike... He wants to learn more about Jesus from you. Why don't you invite him over for dinner? He's like, oh, people. Okay, I'll give it a try. As, as we kept meeting and talking, eventually uh, this guy went from uh, hating the church, hating Jesus and hating the Bible, to coming to a weekly Bible study at Mike's house every week that Mike had it. And Mike went from, you only talk about Jesus, and you only open your Bible here. This is the only place God works. To opening his home to unbelievers. And eventually this man did become a Christian. And the cool thing for me as a pastor was seeing Mike's excitement when we, we had lunch again. He's like, I got, I got to tell you. And I was like, that's great, Mike. And Mike's like, but I don't get it. All I did was have lunch with him. I was like, yeah, Mike. That's how it works. You get to know people, you love people in the ordinary rhythms and routines of your life and their life, and guess what? God does something extraordinary. So I, I want you to see what God can do through you. Don't leave it to like, oh, God only works over there. God only works through Peter and John. God only works through the pastor. But I want you to see oh, what God does through you. That God works the extraordinary in the ordinary. He, he works these miracles to change people's lives with the gospel of Jesus through you. Through you having lunch with them. Through you calling them up. Through you just asking, how are you doing? By the way, that's like the most common greeting, right? How you do it. And the person's response is, how you do it? And you just do this. <laughs> you don't wait for an answer. Do something miraculous. Wait for an answer. Right? See, this is what the story teaches us. This is what God's Word teaches us, that, that God works through us in our everyday rhythms and routines. The second thing that we see here is that Peter and John serve this man, love this man by giving what they have instead of focusing on what they don't have. All right? So here we see... Verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him. You love that language? Like making eye contact with him, looking at him right in the eyes, and said, look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. Because, you know, what's he asking for? Money, help. And they're like, hey, look right at us. Right? Let, let's make eye contact. Anybody get awkward when you make eye contact with a stranger? You're like, oh no, what do I do? Right? So Peter and John are like, hey, no, look at us. We want to see you. We want to know you. 
And imagine his excitement. Someone acknowledged me. Obviously, they're going to give me something, whether it's food or money. But Peter, in verse 6, but Peter said, I don't have silver or gold. So how many of you, that's like a very famous verse, right? And if you grew up with the King James, it's, Silver and gold have I none, which is really weird English. That's why we don't say it that way anymore. But I know you probably memorize it that way, so it's okay. Silver and gold have I none. If you were that guy, how angry would you be right now? Like, why'd you tell me to look at you? Why'd you get my attention? You have nothing to give me. Now imagine Peter and John. We don't have any silver or gold. What possible difference could we make? Right? If, if Peter and John's focus and mentality was only on what they didn't have, there wouldn't be any miracle. But Peter and John give what they have to this person. And here's what they have. They have Jesus. But what I do have, says Peter, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. See, so, Have you noticed the pandemic has kind of been a major bummer, to put it lightly? And one of the things that I have noticed individually and then as groups of people is there's so much focus on what we don't have. And so much focus on what's missing and and what's not there. And one of the things that can happen is when that mentality seeps into the church, we stop believing in miracles. We don't have this. And we don't have that. And we can't do that. And we're not that talented. And we're not that skilled. And right, and you can make it personal, too, when it comes to sharing the gospel of loving people, right? I don't have the right words. I don't have the right training. I don't have the right knowledge. I don't... You know, I can't do this. Imagine if Peter and John just looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none, and just kept on walking. How many of you would still love this story? (laughs) Probably none of us, right? Why do we love the story? Because of what God does. And how does God work? He works through what Peter and John have. And here's the beautiful thing. You and I have exactly what Peter and John have. We we have the Holy Spirit. We have the love of Jesus. And we have the good news of Jesus to give to people. See, we look at the miracle like, I'm not Peter and John. I, I don't have their abilities. I don't have their skills. I don't have what they have. Except that you do. Because you have the Holy Spirit and you have the same Jesus who is alive and well and working in you and through you. It's a famous guy named St. Thomas Aquinas. I say he's famous because I read too much church history and people go, I've never heard of him. Anyway, St. Thomas Aquinas, an incredibly famous Catholic theologian and scholar from the Middle Ages. And people wanted to get to know him and draw him in and you know be be close to him because he's so smart and wise and people listen to him and one day uh, St. Thomas Aquinas is invited by the Pope to come to Rome to see the Vatican and all of its splendor and all of its glory and so St. Thomas Aquinas goes because you can't really tell the Pope no okay and so he goes and he's looking and he's being shown all the beautiful things that the church is building and doing and as he's touring, obviously the Pope is very proud of what, what they have constructed and what they're doing. And he looks at Thomas Aquinas and he says, No longer do we as the church have to tell people, silver and gold have I none. And St. Thomas Aquinas said one of the coolest things ever said in human history. He looked at the Pope and said, Well, maybe that's why we as the church can't say get up and walk anymore. Because we are so focused on, well, we need these buildings and we need these resources and we need these things in order to make a difference, in order for God to use us, in order for God to work a miracle through us. And St. Thomas Aquinas' point was, yeah, well, if we start relying only on all the things that we have or don't have, 
we stop relying on Jesus and the Holy Spirit to do the ministry. See, it doesn't matter what building we have. Now, I know I just offended some of you. It doesn't matter what kind of building we have. It doesn't matter what our budget says. Those things do not determine the ministry that God can do through us. And the same thing becomes true for you personally. It, it doesn't matter what you view yourself as. Of, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I'm not great with the Bible. I don't know all of this. I don't know all that. I don't have these abilities or skills. Anybody ever done this? Where you basically just start making a list of all the reasons why you're not gifted enough to do it? But what I love about this story is that Peter says, I don't have all of that, but I'm going to give you what I do have. And what I do have is the Holy Spirit and Jesus. See, you and I, whether you feel like Peter and John or not, have the same Holy Spirit and have the same Jesus. You and I have the exact same good news of God's love for people, God's forgiveness, God's salvation for people through Jesus to give to others. Meaning, you and I have everything we could ever need to do the ministry that God wants us to do, which is loving people, serving people, and sharing the good news of Jesus with people so that we can see the ultimate miracle happen, which is them coming to faith in Jesus. By the way, the, this whole story continues on through like the rest of chapter 3. The whole point of this story is how it ends with the man and the crowd praising God. Not them praising Peter and John going, wow, how'd you do that? Before them praising God for what he had done in their lives. All right, number three. Do for one what you can't do for all. This was not the only beggar sitting at the temple gates. That was the most common location. And if you read the Gospels, you'll see that oftentimes Jesus' miracles happened in and around the temple place because that's where most people were. That's where the most foot traffic was. So that's where most people that were in need of help went because they're like, hey, there's more opportunities to be cared for and loved and taken care of. So when Peter and John are walking to the temple multiple times a day, doing their ordinary routine, guess what they see? More than just this one person that needs help. Sometimes what we do is we see how great the need is, and we think to ourselves, what difference could I make? I right, talked about this a few weeks ago at the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of the whole world. How are you personally doing on that? Like, I've been to like two other countries besides the United States. So I'm not, like, I'm not really feeling like I'm putting a huge dent in that. Right? So what happens is, well, the need is so great, or the problem is so massive, and I'm just one person. Or we're just one church. What, what difference could we make? Imagine if Peter and John had that attitude, showing up to the temple. Oh, man, there's, there's just too many people to help. And decided, well, because there's so great a need, we won't do anything. That would be a really terrible story in your Bible, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, how many of you would turn the page like, where's the miracle, though? Right? Because what do they do? They, they did for the one what they couldn't do for everybody. Here's the reality. You're probably not going to get to tell every human being on the planet Earth about Jesus in your lifetime. But you could start with one. You probably won't be able to work a miracle in everybody's life. But you could start with one. And look at the difference in this man's life and in the crowd's life when Peter and John do for one what they couldn't do for all. There's a ripple effect. 
They heal the man, and he jumps up, and he starts leaping and walking and praising God and rejoicing, right? And then what happens at the end? Verse 9, all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were all filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. So what starts with one person leads to a whole crowd of people praising and worshiping God. Here's another way to put it. If you want to change the world, start with one human being. Jesus is asked, what are the greatest commandments? What's the greatest thing you could do with your life? He says, it's real simple. Love God and anybody. Okay, but it's like way back here in Matthew. Love your neighbor. Right? What, Jesus asked, what's the greatest thing I could do with my life, Lord? Love God and then love your neighbor. He said, no, I just... Just love the person that I have put in your life. Love the people you work with. Love the people you live with. Those are usually the hardest ones, right? Because they drive you crazy. But you love them anyway because the Lord gave them to you. Love the people you live nearby. Love your brothers and sisters in the church. So we think, well, what, what difference could it make if it's just, I, I'm just one person loving another person? And here's what God does. He does the extraordinary and the ordinary. Yeah, you're just loving one person. You're just telling one person about Jesus. Or like my friend Mike, you're just inviting one person to have lunch with you. Peter and John only healed just one of the beggars. And yet, it led to a whole crowd of people falling in love with Jesus and praising God. See, my hope and prayer for you is that through this story, you would see how God works in the ordinary rhythms and routines of your life and my life, and that you would see how God can work through you to do miracles in people's lives by bringing them to faith in Jesus. See, the reality is you and I have everything that Peter and John had. Because you and I have the Holy Spirit and we have Jesus, meaning we have everything we could ever need already to do the mission and the ministry that God has called us to. All it takes is for us deciding to go, okay, let's just go change one person's life at a time then and then see what God does with it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for all the gifts that you give to us, all the ways that you have equipped us to do your mission and ministry of loving people and sharing the gospel of your forgiveness and resurrection. Help us to see, Lord, how you are working in the ordinary rhythms and routines of our everyday lives to change us and to change others. And Holy Spirit, work through us to change the whole world one person at a time. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand for the prayers of the church. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for all the ways that you take care of us and provide for us. All the ways that you work through the world and through people to meet our needs. Help all of those who are in need of your provision, Lord, whether it is through food or financial help, or through employment or housing, and that you would use us as your people to take all the blessings that you have given to us to love and bless others so that they may praise your good name and worship you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the ways that you work in our lives. We pray for your healing hand to work in the lives of all of our loved ones. We pray for all those who are battling illnesses and sickness. We pray for all of those who are going through surgeries and procedures, that you would continue to bring healing to their bodies and strength and encouragement to their souls. We pray for all those who are patiently awaiting diagnoses, that you would give them patience and comfort in the waiting. 
Holy Spirit, you are the great comforter, and so we ask that you would comfort all those who are mourning and grieving, that you would give to all peace that goes beyond all understanding, and that you would continually point us to the comfort, the hope, the grace, and mercy of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. This time we now continue our service with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Amen. We now join together as a family of faith in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand as we go to our God in prayer. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As you depart today, go in the peace and the blessing of our God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.